next speaker is Nikki Zabel, um, who will be telling us about the Alma Fornax Cluster Survey. Nikki. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm Nikki. I'm actually uh, one of Tim's uh, minions. I'm currently doing my PhD at uh, Cardiff Uni. And as Tim already hinted in his presentation, the environment can be important in quenching uh, the star formation in galaxies. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so pretty much the entire first year of my PhD and a little more have been dedicated to the ALMA Fornix cluster survey. Does this work? This doesn't work. It does not. It's okay. okay, that's all right. Okay. So as Katie so nicely explained in the first presentation, there's a clear bimodality um, for, uh, for what galaxies look like morphologically. You've got the very red and the very blue galaxies. And of course, the main difference between clusters and the field is that there's a lot of red and dead elliptical galaxies in clusters, relatively. And there are many things about the cluster environment that could actually be uh, causing this quenching in galaxies. I listed some of them here. Um, so we've known for a while that um, these processes are important when stripping the atomic gas in galaxies. Um, but the picture has not been as clear for the molecular gas in galaxies as well, because it's much more tightly bound, it's more centrally located, so it's not immediately obvious if this gas as well is directly affected by all these processes I'm listing here. So this was the main goal of our alma fornix cluster survey, was to observe the molecular gas in galaxies in the Fornix cluster and see whether that's directly affected by the cluster environment, basically. So the Fornix Cluster Survey was a complete survey of the 30 galaxies in the Fornix Cluster where we um, either detect dust or H1, which basically indicates that some molecular gas should be present. And it includes a variety of galaxy types. We've got spirals, ellipticals, and also a number of dwarf, actually. So as I said, the main goal was to study the cold molecular gas in these cluster galaxies. And to do that, we looked at the CO1 to 0 line. And they basically gave us the uh, first spatially resolved maps of these galaxies to, um, in detail, study their molecular gas. So why did we choose to look at the Fornex survey, uh, at the Fornex cluster, sorry? So together with the Virgo cluster, Fornex is one of the nearest clusters to us. So yeah, it's really nearby, which is um, really nice to study it in a lot of detail. Um, it's actually been studied a little less than the Virgo cluster. The Virgo cluster is in the northern hemisphere, so it's been looked at a lot. Fornax is in the south, so it's been studied a little less. But there are also some fundamental physical differences between the two clusters. So Fornax is a lot smaller, it's a lot more regular, dynamically involved. So we actually expect all these processes that I showed on my first slide to have had a little more time to affect the gas in these galaxies as well. Despite it being a lot smaller than the Virgo cluster, so when the first catalogs of these clusters were made, I think in the 80s, there were about 2,000 galaxies found in the Virgo cluster and only about like 350 in the Fornix cluster. But despite that, the number density in Fornix is a lot higher than in Virgo. It has about twice as many galaxies per unit volume than the Virgo cluster does. So this means that we expect processes such as ram pressure stripping to maybe be less important than Fornax because it's not as massive, but because there are more galaxies, we would expect things like harassment, galaxy-galaxy interactions, those sort of things, to be more important in Fornax compared to Virgo. And Fornax is actually thought to be slightly more representative of the sort of smaller clusters and groups that most galaxies in the universe reside in. So this is a map of the Fornix cluster, um, the brightest cluster galaxy, NGC 1399 is indicated here in the center. Um, this is the virial radius, this NGC 1316, which is the central galaxy of this infalling group that's currently falling into the Fornix cluster where we don't have any observations. And all the other, co other colored points are uh, observations from the ALMA Fornix cluster survey. So we distinguish here between um, the um, blue plus signs, those are galaxies that we observed and where we don't detect molecular gas at all. Then we have the pink squares, those are galaxies that, where we do detect a molecular gas reservoir and it looks perfectly normal and what it looks like I'll show you in the next slide. And then we've got the red triangles, which are galaxies where we um, detect molecular gas but it looks very irregular and disturbed and I'll show you an example of that later as well. So we can see that our non-detections, our regular detections, and our disturbed detections are all sort of distributed all over the cluster. 
You could maybe say that the disturbed galaxies tend to be a little bit at larger radii around the virial radius, but it's obviously very small uh, number of statistics, so it's hard to say for sure. So I would like to move on to some examples of galaxies that we detect. Um, so this is basically the nicest, prettiest galaxy in the sample that's like a perfect textbook example of what, you know, CO uh, would look like. So in the um, left image here, we have an intensity map of the molecular gas. We've got a one kiloparsec scale bar and the beam here indicated as well. And we can see that the gas here is concentrated in the center and the um, surface brightness decreases nicely, radially outward, um, in almost a perfect circle, projected anyway. Um, we've got a velocity map here in the center, so the blue colors are the blue shifted gas, red colors are the red shifted gas, and we can see that the gas in this galaxy rotates very nicely between minus 80 and 80 kilometers per second. And then on the right here, we have the same intensity map here on the left, but now we plot it on an optical image of the galaxy to basically see where the molecular gas is distributed compared to um, the stellar body of the galaxy. This arrow here points in the direction of the center of the cluster. And we can see that in this case, it's nicely sitting in the center, perfectly symmetric, exactly where we would expect it. And these are the same images, but for one of the disturbed galaxies, or the galaxies with disturbed gas in our sample. And that looks very different, so we don't have one nice peak in the middle that sort of decreases outward anymore. But there are multiple peaks, it looks very messy. If you look at the velocity map with a little bit of imagination, you can sort of maybe see some rotation still because this side is more blue, that's more red, but obviously there's a lot more random motions going on than in the previous example. And then if we look at where the gas is compared to the stellar body of this galaxy, we actually see that there's this big tail sort of outside the stellar body of this galaxy um, that where the um, gas is basically sitting um, that's more or less aligned with the direction uh, of the cluster center as well. So the next sort of obvious thing to do is to then uh, calculate molecular gas fractions. So that's uh, what I'm showing here. I'll talk you through what is going on in this plot. So um, we compare the molecular gas fractions of the galaxies in our cluster to what's going on in the field. So that's what I'm showing here. This is uh, from the cold gas uh, sample as well. Um, this bit is extrapolated, obviously, so that's not ideal. And the gray areas are the one, two, and three sigma areas of this relation, basically. And the two sort of things to take away, I think, from this figure is, first of all, that um, all galaxies in our sample are actually molecular gas depleted uh, compared to uh, field galaxies, uh, deficient, I meant, sorry. They're all well below the one sigma confidence uh, area of the relationship for field galaxies, except for NGC 1365, which is a massive spiral in the cluster that's basically an exception in many ways. And the second thing is that, um, so I'm distinguishing here between galaxies with disturbed molecular gas and regular molecular gas. The regular ones are the black ones here, and the disturbed ones are all the red ones. And so we can see that there is this transition sort of around three times 10 to the nine solar masses um, where all galaxies with stellar masses below this basically show disturbed molecular gas um, reservoirs. And uh, uh, the triangles here instead of the circles are the ones that show asymmetries like the example I showed earlier. So those are even more deficient than all the other ones. Do I have time for a last slide? I think yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So for this is all work in progress, so I need to say that. Um, for some of our galaxies, we also have um, resolved H-alpha observations. So I would like, that's something I'm working on now. Um, so this is a three-color uh, image of, again, this, uh, this is the same example as the second example of a galaxy I showed earlier. So this is, the, again, the same map of the molecular gas in this galaxy. Um, and now the pink stuff here, that's the H-alpha. And the white is, uh, again, the optical light from this galaxy. And as Katie um, so nicely explained in the first talk, is that you can look at uh, the Kennecott-Schmidt relation of these things, where on the y-axis you have the amount of star formation per, uh, per surface area, and on the x-axis you have the, um, molecular, the amount of molecular gas per surface area. And if you divide the two by each other, you can basically get the depletion times, which means uh, how long does it take to um, 
to transform this molecular gas into stars. How efficient is that? And that's what I'm showing here. This is basically a map of the depletion times of the molecular gas in this galaxy. This shows the optical contours. And what we can see really nicely here is that the gas that is inside the stellar body of the galaxy has very low depletion times. Um, so it's very efficiently transforming the molecular gas into stars. But in this big tail that is outside of the, uh, of the galaxy, basically, the star formation is very inefficient and the depletion times are very long. Um, this actually goes up to over 10 giga years. So in this tail, there is basically not really star formation going on whatsoever. Yeah, so that's it from my side. I'll leave you with my conclusion. So we basically found that in our survey of the Fornix cluster, all galaxies with masses below three times 10 to the nine uh, stellar masses show disturbed molecular gas. Um, galaxies in uh, the Fornix cluster, and especially the ones with disturbed molecular gas, show um, atomic gas, or molecular gas, I'm sorry, deficiencies, which basically means that Fornax is still a very active environment that strongly influences the molecular gas in its galaxies. Um, we found both detections and non-detections and disturbed and non-disturbed molecular gas all over the cluster, and we see some examples of possibly ongoing round pressure stripping uh, in the cluster as well. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really nice, right. nice stuff. Great to see some of that detailed work as, as well. Are there questions? Uh, yeah, Quentin. Um, do you, by chance, in your observations, do you detect the, the underlying the continuum emission? For some of the galaxies, we do, yeah, with only a handful. And do you, what, what kind of morphology do you see there? Is this, so it, it should be tracing the cold dust, right, at, this, at the frequency of CO, or is it already in the... Yeah, so the galaxies where we do detect continuum are typically one of the, some of the larger ones that have, yeah, that have AGN, obviously, so those are not the sort of interesting ones that show a lot of like, weird stuff. Yeah. So I, was, I was curious to know if like, the dust was kind of following the molecular gas and those very disturbed galaxies or not. Uh, that's, I think, something we're going to look at in the future. Thank you. Well, let's thank Nick right. again. Thank that's you. fine.